Recording in progress. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Sexauer. I'm a project manager at X, the Moonshot Factory. You might know us as Google X. We're Google's future technology division responsible for things like self-driving cars, stratospheric internet balloons, and many other efforts I'm not allowed to talk to you about, <laughs> which is fine because that's not what you're here for today. I've been fortunate enough to be following the work of Igor Goliak and Sarah Stackhouse at the Arlington Players Theater and their Zero G Virtual Theater Lab for the past two plus years. It's been amazing to see the evolution of their work and their mastery at integrating technology and virtual elements into a traditionally in-person medium. Which started with a desktop and some duct tape in Igor's living room has transformed into entirely original experiences for patrons of the arts, no matter where they are in the world. The current production we're discussing is The Orchard, an auction, which features Jessica Hecht and the incomparable Mikhail Baryshnikov. It also features a giant KUKA robot arm, holograms, projections, a robot dog, live streaming with real-time effects broadcast to audiences around the world, including the added feature of being fully interactive online. This shows a hybrid, meaning it's performed live for an in-person audience, and at the same time, there's a different virtual production streaming to people on their computers where they can watch and interact. This is quite an artistic and technological feat, and it took a tremendous and very innovative team to make this project happen. And we're fortunate enough to have some of that team here with us today. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you in a moment, but first we're gonna show you a trailer for the show uh, for those of you who are unable to see the production just yet. So let's roll that. Wonderful. So let's have our incredible panel introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about who you are and the role you played on the production. We'll start with you, Igor. Hi, I'm Igor Goliak. I'm the artistic director of Arlington Players Theater and Zero Gravity Virtual Theater Laboratory and the director of The Orchard, the uh, in-person and the hybrid uh, virtual uh, and auction. And Eamon, go ahead. Yeah, hi, actually, um, I firstly had an apology. I, I had a bit of a calendar mix up, so I'm on the road in LA actually. Um, so apologies for the shaky iPhone video. Um, my name's Eamon, I'm from Bird Dog in Australia. We're a company that makes cameras. We're really excited to, uh, to partner with Igor and the whole team to uh, uh, provide the cameras for the live streaming of this, uh, this production. I'm also here with Dan, who's our CEO, who's driving. Maybe he won't speak too much, but uh, he's in the car as well. So, Thank you. Adam. <clears throat> uh, I'm Adam uh, Pajkowski, uh, Executive Technical Director at a studio, an innovation studio called Dot Dot Dash. Um, <clears throat> was working with Igor uh, very early on uh, to bring the um, different layers of technology to life. Um, and figure out how we're going to create a cohesive production out of it. Um, it's been a joy, joy to work on um, together. Um, I'll pass it over to Tom. I'm Tom Abernathy. I uh, am the interactive narrative designer, uh, as I was for Checkoff OS as well, uh, which basically means that I collaborate with Igor and others on what the streaming experience is going to be, and then uh, I write uh, the text primarily for Antosha, for those of you who are in the chat. And during performances, I am actually uh, playing Antosha live during in the chat, although occasionally it's not me, it's Zach doing IT stuff, but tech support, you know. Uh, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Dunlap. I'm the uh, stream designer and visual effects. I've been working nonstop for the past two weeks. So do I look bleary eyed? Because I am. <laughs> well, thank you for your work. 
Uh, and last but not least, Magda. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, I am a principal researcher at MetaLab at Harvard. And um, Igor and I am, I guess, theoretician. Um, Igor and I have been in, you know, good friends and colleagues and, and collaborators for a couple of years now discussing um, this type of performances initially in theory and, you know, how would they actually implement, be implemented and what needs to happen with the script and with the um, entire experience of stage if you're trying to make it uh, into hybrid because, you know, the entire dramatic structure changes and there are many different things that happen um, in when you're trying to combine all those different media. So, um, so I guess that's my role. Yeah, Igor, it's the theoretician. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here today. You know, we'll jump we'll jump into some questions and and, and get some conversations started. I'm coming at you first, Igor. So, how did you get started working with technologies and and virtual theater? Well, it was more of a necessity when the pandemic hit. Uh, we, we have a space uh, out just outside of Boston, and uh, we just everyone was da down, and we had shows that we canceled in our space. And I, I just couldn't believe that theater would end uh, for me, and just to you know hang on at home. I was still teaching uh, over Zoom. And, uh, and then I, you know, I started getting bills for the uh, studio and decided to experiment with uh, my wife, Daria, and uh, see if uh, I could create something in home um, using our white walls as, uh, as a canvas and then interpreting that through the, through the character's um, kind of psyche and through how she interprets the world and figured out a way how to hack a couple of things together. And it seemed to work. I would say so. Um, so this show particularly features a lot of um, bird dog PTZ cameras. Why these particular cameras? Well, uh, one of the biggest reasons why these PTZ cameras, uh, we have a very complicated structure of what is being seen in person and what is being seen on the on the virtual we have 12 cameras and uh the just cabling uh if it wasn't for ndi which is what a bird dog is known for uh not just video quality but uh but ndi feeds uh full quality in the ndi feeds and I, i'm sure Eamon can speak uh, better to this but the fact that we have we send signal back and forth using MDI, which is the type of uh, signal without routing it using the old style SDI cables, um, lets us allows us to move into the theater much quicker. Run one cable to a camera uh, and to a to a computer, and have all those feeds available for all the three camera three computers that we have here. I just I'm sitting in the pit, and this is Liana. She's our brilliant. Uh, technical uh, designer and um, implementer of the stream. And this wouldn't be possible on the budget that we have uh, and uh, with the time that we have uh, using old ways of uh, moving into a theater with 12 cameras. So that's why Bird Dog PTZs. Perfect. You know, we can go to the source too. We have Eamon here with us, uh, president and founder of bird dog. So, Eamon, your cameras are used all over the world for broadcasting. What was so unusual about this project and, and the use of the, the cameras? I know Igor alluded to that, but it'd be great to get your perspective. Like, why is bird dog so interested in this particular project? Yeah, so um, it's really exciting for us. Um, we're, we're a, a startup Australian company. We've been uh, sort of the 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 leading developers, I guess, of this NDI format that Igor spoke about, which is a way of sending video and audio across uh, computer networks rather than using video infrastructure, you know, the old way. And um, yeah, this, this project is really exciting for us because it gave us a chance to really show off not just the NDI component of what we do, but also the video quality. You know, theater productions have lots of changing light. They have lots of, um, you know, darkness as well because, you know, when the, the light changes, so it really got, gave us a chance to show off the... Uh, you know, the quality of the sensors that we use because we use you know all Sony broadcast image sensors. They gave us a really, really good chance to show off the picture quality of the cameras. So super excited to work on this project with uh, Igor and the team. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to go over to Magda. Um, so you're a researcher about transmedia and, and virtual theater. I'd love you to provide a little bit of the context. When, when you see the work that Igor is doing with projects like The Orchard, where do you see them fitting into the larger world of emerging genres of, of virtual theater? What, what's happening here in Igor's work with these technologies that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, you know, this is a very great question because you know, there is a kind of a, my got a camera for Christmas uh, syndrome with, you know, using new technology oftentimes. And there is a sort of disconnect between form and content. What we see actually with Igor's work, which is very interesting, is that there is a, a very clear um, connection and commentary, kind of a meta commentary of, um, of, of form on content. And so um, just to give you like a brief overview, like, you know, what is the play about and what is the form commenting about that the play is about, yeah? So it's also kind of a meta commentary on theater and on in sort of an impossibility of staging this old text, which, um, you know, it's a kind of an illusion to, to, to say that we can recreate this world, yeah? And so we have, you know, this is a play about time and about passing of time and about the kind of a cruelty of passing of time. And we see this um, a very interesting montage between the text and the technology that is being used and it's very presented on stage. It's both a kind of uncanny experience and it's also a sort of a form of a mental montage, which we also see in Kubrick in Odyssey, yeah, from the uh, you know, ancient bone to the spaceship. And here we have from Chekhov and this world of, you know, of the empire, of kind of a nostalgia behind, you know, for the empire and this technology 100 years into the future. And this com compression of time uh, creates this kind of effect of commenting on what the play is about. So here we have uh, this sort of transmedial multi-platform use of technology, which is also a meta commentary on the way that um, the technology can be used and that can comment on the content of the drama itself. So this is quite unusual because it does not have happened very often that we would have this um, you know, combination of form and content commenting to each other in theater. Um, oftentimes those things are very separate. So I think this is what's sort of unique in Igor's work is that those two things work in tandem and they comment on each other. Thank you. I have about 70 follow-up questions, but I have other people here today. Um, so I will, well, I'll save those for later. Um, Eric, so I understand that you just returned to Germany from Boston, where you and Igor, along with the streaming TD, uh, Liana Keys, worked long into the nights to create the effects and camera presets to, uh, for this unique virtual experience. I also want to mention that the projections in the show you saw, shown on the hologauze on the stage, were designed by uh, Alex Bosco Koch, and that you and Igor worked with many of his images while creating effects for the virtual production. So we're going to show some of those images right now um, and what you see, but while you're watching those, can you tell us a bit, Eric, about what you and Igor were trying to accomplish here with the cameras and the effects and how you went about doing it? Um, well, well, first of all, I think from the streaming side, we're trying to create uh, a unique other experience. I mean, there is the experience of the theater when you're sitting in the room and, and it's live. And when you're sitting there on stage, you can choose whether to watch the person speaking or whether to watch what's happening in the background. You can really like move your eye around. Uh, if something's just streamed, it's, it's hard to do that if you only have like one camera from the front or from the side. So with all these different cameras and all these different things, we're really trying to bring in different looks, different points of view in different ways um, to really give you an experience that not, not only that you're in the theater, but a lot of times that you're on stage with the actors. And, and then with some of the effects, we tried to overlay sort of a way to, to create more emotion or to create some mood or, or to, to try to enhance sort of what the actors were doing when it worked, uh, that to, to sort of bring about, to use sort of the effects to, to provide a theme for loss or, or memory. So it's really about trying to craft an alternate version of the life. And you're definitely not exaggerating about how much we worked. No exaggeration there. <laughs> I, I have zero doubt of that. Um, 
Can you tell us a little bit about like uh, how you went about it? Well, a lot of this stuff, uh, I mean, I came to it, they'd already done the previous production. So um, as Alex's work was already, had already been created and the piece had already been created. So one of the reasons why I'm pulling from Alex's uh, material is to try and reinforce the show as it was. Um, then it was a matter of, because I'm working partially remotely and then also there, it's a matter of working uh, in a way to how to like visualize uh, how it all fits together. Um, Alex and I both use a piece of software called Isadora, which is used in a lot of theaters and it is a lot of live effects. That's been something I've been dealing with for quite some time, uh, is how to make live effects really happen. So everything then routed through um, or with the bird dog and the NDI stuff, that's really awesome. I mean, there's no way I could have on this budget and with this thing, there's no way I could have done this otherwise with NDI. So uh, my hats off to the bird dog people and to NDI. And if anybody from Isadora team is listening, um, good job. We will talk about the NDI uh, actor. Um, still a little bit more work to do, like, but but it's coming. Um, I think I'm getting off track. <laughs> But really, no, really, it's about, I think that when 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 Igor approached me, it was kind of out of the blue. And when he came to me with what he was trying to do, it was really fascinating uh, because I've been working in, in this kind of vein for a long time, how he's really trying to like change the way you see theater, not just live, but to bring it to people online through streaming. So that was a big, a big pull for me and, and why I was really involved. Thank you. And then the work shows, it looked beautiful. It's, oh, it, it's truly amazing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see the uh, last night's performance, um, but you brought it up an interesting point. Igor, why a separate production and experience for a virtual audience instead of just streaming the play? What are you going after? What are you trying to create or learn or invent or break? Yeah, uh, so the reason uh, each, uh, each art uh, kind of uh, tool has its own kind of rules of what works and what doesn't. So if I was creating this as a movie, I would do it completely different than what, what you saw on stage. And so now we have to interpret uh, what we came up with for the in-person and make a diff completely different art piece because it's, it's not going to work as a stream in the virtual. So what I'm what I'm experimenting is is how do you hold uh, how how do you hold attention of the audience? How do you have emotional impact on the audience using uh, using the stream? Uh, how do you enhance it? How do you have the audience participate in the uh, in the in the feed? Um, participate in in what's happening, not just um, not just. Uh, watching it as a movie where it's only kind of one way because I could never uh, with a live stream I could never it, it could never be as good as a movie so uh, what are the advantages of uh, doing it live the fact that the audience can interact with the characters they uh, there's a confessional where one of the characters speaks to the audience there is uh, the auction the the audience has a role to play in this uh, in this version of the um, of the online uh, in the online. Uh, so it's it's quite different, and uh, and and uh, that's where the experimentation is: is how do you grab their attention and have a meaningful experience for them, translated from what happens on stage to a two dimensional screen. It works. It works real well. Um, um, keep that up. Thank you. So let's talk about the robot in the room. Adam, one of the stars of the show is Ronin, the giant robot on stage, otherwise known as Antosha to the virtual audience. How did you get involved in the project and, and what did you take, what did it take to get the robotics to happen as part of this project artistically and technically? <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, Ronan is a, a, a happy member of the, the dot dot dash family. Um, we actually have a number of, of different uh, bots of different shapes and sizes and functions um, <clears throat> and robotics um, in entertainment and in sort of media, transmedia or, or, or immersive, inver immersive environments um, is really uh, one of the things that we're known for and that we do quite a lot of. Um, this production was awesome. I mean, 
basically, uh, I had been connected with Igor at the very beginning of the first run of the show um, through some mutual friends. And immediately, uh, once that conversation kicked off, um, <clears throat> and uh, we had a, had a few uh, discussions around, you know, what Igor was trying to accomplish and like how we could possibly do it. Um, the second that the robots got brought up, it seemed like a, a, an immediate like marriage of uh, this could be something really exciting. This could be a way to push. Um, and we had talked about a ton of different technologies. I mean, one of that's sort of my background is finding uh, fringe technology for uh, use cases outside of their traditional um, uh, application. Um, and so, you know, when we got the opportunity, you know, I've, I've actually never worked in theater before. This is my first theater production. Um, have done all sorts of things like touring shows and uh, museums, you know, you name it, I've probably touched it, but theater is so different. Um, and especially through the conversations with Igor, like thinking about, okay, like how do these robots come to life? Like one of the things that's so impressive about them is that they are extremely mechanical and um, they're very repeatable in what they do, you know, down to like millimeter accuracy, we can place a tool head uh, for, for manufacturing. Um, but you know, the challenge in, in all of these instances is like, how do you bring life to these things? Uh, how do you how do you add uh, a layer of emotion and, and, and draw connection? Um, and we worked with um, one of our programmers, um, Tom, uh, who is fantastic uh, and, and amazing. Um, and uh, through the process uh, really brought to life, um, you know, how, how these robots interacted with the set, how they interacted with the different characters, the other actors, um, and really became like a core part of the narrative. Um, and, you know, that was developed, uh, like technically we, we use simulation software to build a lot of those different moves. So uh, same as you would do for a 3D animation, um, uh, that, that type of workflow um, is how it starts. Uh, but then, you know, we built a prototype within our studio um, where we actually had uh, Ronan set up um, we had built up, you know, some white walls and really we're like, okay, looking at the motion, we're like, how does this feel? How does it look? Sending videos back and forth from our studio in Portland to Igor in Boston um, and, and working back and forth. Uh, and then ultimately got into the theater um, and started rehearsing with actors and seeing how they responded um, to the robot, getting them comfortable with it, right? Because it's this giant daunting piece of equipment on stage. Um, it's something that, you know, is moving and truthfully is very dangerous and, and scary. Um, and so building the systems and having things in place um, in order to make it less scary and more safe um, and to, to see how the interaction between um, man and machine comes to life um, was, was really powerful. It was, a, it was super awesome to watch. I mean, that's the, the sort of creative side of it. And then, I mean, technically, uh, Igor and Sarah and, and the rest of the crew can tell you getting, getting that robot into the Baryshnikov Art Center, which was the first place that the theater uh, or the, the show was performed, uh, was no easy task. Um, it required uh, sort of these very um, tough moves to, to even get the robot into the elevator and under the weight capacity and onto the stage. Um, a bunch of engineering went into, into just getting it into the building. Um, and once it was in the building, then the magic could start to happen. Um, so it was, it was a great process and it was, it, was a, it was a pleasure to be a part of. Thank you. I, I work with a lot of roboticists and, and I know that the, the, the accuracy and tech and the work that goes behind bringing, bringing that, uh, an object like that uh, into motion and to life, um, which is why we'll go to Tom, who, 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 who gave a little more life to that movement. Um, so Tom, you're a narrative game writer for video games and Igor invited you to write the script for the virtual in the voice of the robot. Uh, or as you call him, Antosha. Why the name Antosha? And what special role or voice did you help to create for him in the virtual version of The Orchard? Uh, well, why Antosha? You'd have to ask uh, Igor, but I think it's because it's a diminutive of Anton as in Anton Chekhov. Am I right, Igor, in saying that? It is a diminutive. He actually used the pseudonym uh, before he started publishing his big oh, that's plays. Right. Uh, he used a pseudonym, uh, and his uh, pseudonym was uh, Antosha Chekhonte. Um, so that's where that's where Antosha comes from. Yeah. Um, but uh, but actually, the the we didn't have the idea of uh, making. Well, okay. 
I had the I, I I come to things through character. I come through my work as a dramatist in games, in in theater, in film, whatever, um, through character. And uh, so my instinct is always we need a character to be interacting directly with the audience. Um, uh, in pre in previous shows, like with Chekhov OS, we had human characters uh, played by Daria, uh, Igor's wife, for example, um, as well as AI characters. In this show. There's enough human characters doing stuff on stage, uh, and it had no need to augment that. Um, but it felt right to create a character that could that could interact directly with the audience during the show, so that they really did have a sense that it's not just the actors who are live on stage, um, but that this entire experience, the streaming experience, is a thing that is reaching out and connecting with them, uh, and speaking to them, and reacting to them, um, and. From, from that insight to going, oh, look, there's a giant 8,000 pound robot arm on the stage um, that that otherwise is a little bit, uh, uh, for some people is gonna, is gonna, they're gonna wonder exactly what that's about. Why don't, you know, why don't we um, use that as sort of the, 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 the place to, to, to grow a character from? So that was sort of the thought process behind that. Thank you. It, it worked. Uh, I got I got quite a few quite quite a few laughs. Um, I and I I felt closer to the robot. I definitely talked in chat to the robot quite a few times um, during the performance uh, last last night. Um, I was in the chat last night. I remember it was it was it was it was a good one. Uh, Igor, talking about interactivity in the virtual as we talk about the chat. You've, you've been experimenting with a, a lot with audience interactivity and opportunities um, through these various productions. Um, what have your experiments been? What are you trying to do here? And, and what have you learned about audience behavior online? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me is uh, always what is possible to do with within the constraints of, uh, of, of, of the environment where the play is being performed. So in this case, the environment is the virtual, right? And so there are advantages and disadvantages of the virtual. Uh, that the disadvantages are that you can't feel, you can't, it's very difficult to be a part of a, a group, uh, it, um, uh, witnessing something or going through uh, something at the same time um, uh, with the actors and the audience in the same place. Um, with, uh, with the virtual, uh, there are some advantages where just like you've described, there's, there could be a couple of different two or three different narratives that are happening simultaneously. So there is, the, there is what's happening on stage and then there is that stage being interpreted through the chat and that's a separate narrative Right, that's overlaid on, uh, and, and that doesn't happen in the in the in-person uh, performance. Um, so that that's an advantage of the virtual that we don't have uh, in person. There is a there's an auction that's happening that's also real time. It's also uh, a gives uh, the role a role to an audience member, but also a way to, for them to engage and and go through a journey different from the in-person audience, but their own journey. And then when the audience members see themselves and each other on, uh, on the Holocaust for on the in-person uh, show, uh, and also see themselves um, in the background uh, or, or characters uh, talking to them and they, they're in the background, uh, I think it adds, a, it, it's a way to, uh, for people to come together in one, space right in one virtual space so that those those are my experimentations is it's mainly what are the tools that are available to use for the virtual world what works what doesn't work and it's an it's its own genre that has to be explored and uh, i think there's a uh, there's a big future uh in front of it so what you're doing in practice um igor and experimenting in i think is 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 part of a bigger Part of a bigger picture of, of evolution. So I want to ask Magda, this is what you study at, at Harvard, uh, to my understanding. How has this interactivity online uh, evolved over time and how, how does it fit with this show? Yeah, um, well, when we think about um, interactivity, um, 
first, you have to start with the concept of co-presence and how in different genres co-presence is created. Um, so, you know, in theater is the type of co-presence when you have to be there with other people at the same time and in the same place to build um, a kind of a share um, interactive experience between, you know, the, the actors, the playwright and the audience, yeah? There is this sort of uh, exchange happening in real time and um, in real space. Now, um, the same kind of co-presence is in some way, you know, virtually both um, in, um, in movies and in literature, where you are by yourself interacting with a work of art that communicates something to you and to other people. And so the, the co-presence, the interactivity that is happening between you and the creators um, is more of an interior, a mental type of interactivity. Now, um, in video games, uh, we typically have a little bit of combination of both. Uh, we have um, a kind of interior, you know, you alone in your apartment interacting um, uh, with other players in the same time, at the same time in different space, in different place, in different space. Uh, but there is a sort of mental connection that you all might have and you interact with each other and with uh, the creators of the game. Now, what is sort of tricky about transmedial works is that you're trying to, um, um, in some ways, um, create a new form of interactivity, which would combine all of those different types of, of uh, co-presence. Um, so we are simultaneously at the same time, um, um, but maybe in different place, but the mental space, the co-presence that is, um, that creates meaning um, between the makers and the audience, uh, you know, that's kind of a cognitive space uh, is being created virtually. And so, um, so the mechanism by which we create it has to be different than what we previously had in theater or in film or in literature. And this is what's uh, so cool that, you know, Igor and um, some, a few other, you know, adventurous uh, theater makers are trying to reinvent the game and reinvent and invent a new genre in which um, the co-presence would be a completely de defined in a completely different way than previously in previous um, art forms. Thank you. So as we sit here in the future, I'm going to ask as a, as a wrap up, I'm going to challenge each of our panelists to take two minutes and answer the following questions. Where is this experimentation leading? And what do you think the future holds? Uh, we unfortunately lost um, Eamon, but he did. He was able to answer this question for us before he left, so I'm going to share his thoughts. With innovators like Igor, the sky is really the limit. Interactive productions where the audience is able to be a part of the production itself brings a whole new element. As a technology company, Bird Dog is really excited to be able to be a part of such a groundbreaking production, art meeting technology. It honestly could be could not be any cooler from their perspective. Um, why don't we start with Eric? Um, I think all of this experimentation uh, leads uh, to two things. And um, the one is sort of, uh, redefining live theater, uh, how it looks, just what happens, uh, how to view it. And the second is um, opening up live theater to new audiences in new ways. I mean, I, I really don't, that's really like the fact that people that don't go to theater, don't know Chekhov, have the chance to just sit at home and watch something, you know, gives them the chance to go, oh, that's really okay. Well, it's better than Netflix or it's different than Netflix. Uh, maybe next time I'll go sit in a room with theater. And, and the fact that you add all of these uh, ways of looking at theater live in the room, in the theater with other people, because you feel the energy when you're with people and you feel their energy, the, 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 the audience, the people on stage. By adding these other elements, it, it sort of helps to redefine like, well, what is theater? What is theater moving towards? How to integrate like, what is the future into what is the age old past of the history of theater. I mean, drama has been around for how long? 
So that's what I think. Thank you. Oh. Um, well, since I'm coming at this from the video game side, um, although I have a background in theater, um, for me, I think there's a couple of challenges that, you know, that have to be uh, negotiated with and figured out as, as we move forward. I think one of them is um, simply that uh, the, the time scale on which, the time frame on which games are made, even indie games, fairly small games with small teams, um, is a lot longer than the time frame in which most theatrical productions are made. And that's We've already found that to be something of a challenge because it limits, uh, to an to, in some ways, um, you know what you can do from sort of the interactive, the digital side because because um, you can you can get a play up and running in a few weeks if you're if you're really putting your back into it, um, whereas it's very difficult to do that with a game. It's it's pretty much impossible, um, and so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that as I'm sure Magda knows very well, one of, one of the key elements in uh, video game design, um, and this is certainly a thing that plays into narrative design, is the idea that unlike traditional theater audiences who are active and in the room, but they're also still sitting in a chair and they're, and they're receiving, uh, so there's a passive nature to, the, to their sort of experience, and you just refer to, uh, or uh, uh, Eric referred to Netflix, um, uh, you know, like that. Games are not supposed to be like that, right? Games are supposed to be a thing that engage you and where you are playing an active role in how the thing unfolds. And so we know that there is, uh, there's an element of agency, of player agency, if you will, that we need uh, in the digital side of this, uh, ultimately, for it to really feel like um, a truly interactive experience. And, and in, in this uh, show, what you see with, uh, the way you see us doing that is the auction of the NFT. Um, and then most of the other auction stuff is sort of, it, it feels like it's interactive and real, but really that's kind of smoke and mirrors. And that, that's how we do it in games sometimes. Sometimes we give the illusion of agency rather than actual agency. Um, but uh, but there needs to be some actual agency. And, and uh, you know, figuring out how to, get a good solid handshake between um, theater and the way theater is traditionally done and experienced and the way interactive entertainment uh, like a video game is, is generally experienced. Um, that's, that's a challenge and it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Adam. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, you know, your question, where is this leading and, you know, what does the future hold is an interesting one. And, Eric and Tom, uh, thank you for teeing that up perfectly. Um, but I think from my perspective, a lot of what we're seeing now in, in the mediums that are, or in people that are pushing in the mediums that they traditionally come from, whether it be theater, whether it be games, whether it be museums, uh, even on the brand side, um, you know, the, it, it all sort of lends itself to one thing, um, which is that you know, these tools are becoming more prolific. They're being able to be used across these different mediums. And really we're blurring lines, right? We're blurring the lines between what a digital experience is, between what a game is, between what an immersive experience is, what you experience at home versus what you experience out of home. Um, and it's really exciting, right? Because um, each of, with each of these lines that's blurred and each of these uh, sort of uh, best practices from each one of these um, industries um, or art forms, um, really uh, we get to tell deeper and richer stories. Um, and you know where this is all headed in my mind um, is that we're gonna have these amazing narratives that we can tell um, and, and on different devices and in different places and in different ways um, and really bring people into them, um, you know, where they are. We can meet people in their living room. We can have people come out to a public space um, and connect them all through, through a singular thread. Um, and I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And this is a really great example of like how that can be done well. Um, and it's really hard, right? Because there are no rules. And, uh, and a lot of the, the things that traditionally work maybe in one, in one case don't work in another. Um, so the experimentation that's happening here is so exciting. Uh, and I think that's why you see everybody on this call and everybody as part of this production uh, be really you know, so enthusiastic about, about what's happening here um, because we really are pushing the boundaries and seeing what can be done next.
Thank you. Amanda. Well, I mean, I think it leads to a kind of metaverse, uh, hopefully much more sophisticated and complex than the one that Mark Zuckerberg is trying to build and a little bit more successful one as well. Um, but I think this is the future uh, in some way. Um, the blending of our realities is already happening and making you know, changes to the way that we conceptualize ourselves. There is a whole area of studies which is trying to figure out how this sort of a double existence between the virtual and real self coexist um, and how the stories will be told and what the purpose of the stories will be. I mean, we know, you know, that um, film and theater, they have premise, every story has a premise. Um, so what will be the purpose of the stories told in the metaverse will be another question that we will have to um, kind of decide. Um, but that's um, that's my prediction and I'm sticking to it. I'm looking forward to meeting everybody there. Um... To wrap things up, we'll turn to the mastermind behind the orchard. You've heard multiple versions of 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 the future um, that that could be potentially a friend of us, Igor. But what's next for you? What's next for the orchard? Uh, where is Zero G and Virtual Theater Lab going? What questions, experiments, what futures and iterations do you have in store for us? <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, uh, I want to, first of all, thank you for all those beautiful and um, incredible comments about uh, what the future holds. I think we're speaking about the same thing, just from different directions. Um, for me, what's most interesting is the hu in theater uh, and in life, I guess, is uh, uh, the human connection. And uh, with the world getting smaller, it seems like we should be closer, but um, uh, to me, it seems like it's it's on the contrary. People are getting uh, far, even though they're very connected uh, on and in social media. It seems like people are more and more disconnected. The smaller the world becomes, and uh, theater has always, um, I think, found a way uh, to to build those connections with people. And for me, and one of the things that I'm looking forward to and really the purpose of what, what I'm doing is try to connect people in the virtual, actually, actually connect and have them go through experiences together and make it work and um, give access to the people that cannot be in the physical space with us um, today uh, or at the time of the, of the show. So, for me, it's, it, it goes back to the very uh, kind of basics of, of this art form, which is the human connection, the common, um, the, the empathy, the common humanity in us, and, uh, and, and how do we connect us? Uh, how do we connect our souls? Is it possible to hold the breath together um, while experiencing a production in the virtual? And that is a specific goal that I have. How do I make the audience to hold breath together in the virtual? Well, I think you're accomplishing that. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for being here. And thank you for everybody who's been watching. Uh, if you have any other questions or thoughts or any curiosities, please feel free to write us at info at arlequinplayers.com. And please come see The Orchard. There's two more shows tonight and tomorrow. Uh, you can find more information at www.theorchardoffbroadway.com. Thanks to all the panelists here, to Arlequin Players Theater, to Arts Emerson, and to HowlRound for hosting us today. And uh, we'll see you all in the metaverse.